3, um, verses 20 through chapter 4, verse 1. Um, this kind of brings to an end, really, the, the teaching part. I mean, everything that Paul does tries to teach us something. Um, chapter 4, basically, is um, he's saying goodbye and things like that. But I'm sure there's, there is definitely things to learn in that. But this is, verse 20 is really a continuation of, since verse 12, um, trying to exhort the people to press on. <clears throat> now, as I read this, just actually let me read it first here. Philippians 3, 20 through 4, 1. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. Now, as I was reading this, this is kind of the way the Holy Spirit works with me as I'm reading this and meditating on it, certain phrases or words just seem to pop out to me, and, and over the years I've come to believe that that's the Holy Spirit saying, hey, this is important for what I want you to share. The first thing really that stuck out to me was, but our citizenship is in heaven. So we are citizens of heaven. Now Paul was contrasting this, being citizens of heaven, with what we just had read in verse 18 and 19 about um, the enemies of the cross. In verse 18 and 19, it says the enemies of the cross, um, their God is their, their appetites, their stomach, um, that their destination is destruction, and that basically they're set on earthly things. So their citizenship is of earth. We once all were citizens of earth, if you will. Um, and... So, as I thought about this, I was reminded of what the Holy Spirit had showed us about this about a year ago. Um, actually, the first message that I spoke when I came here um, to see if this is where God wanted me to be, us to be at. Um, so, those held in captive by past hurts and misconceptions and lies and mind games and the like will be sent to us. Oh, actually, what I spoke about at the end of December, I'm going to get to the other part, but what I spoke to on the last message of the year about this year and about what God wants to do with us, this koinonia, this fellowship, and the, the people that he wants to send to us and that it's critical that this fellowship has unity and unity is expressed in love. Um, so these captives, these people that will become the redeemed, they um, have past hurts and misconceptions about God and lies that they've heard and mind games. Um, these folks will be sent to us. These are people that could be our children, could be our neighbors, um, friends from school. Uh, but the Lord, you know, some of these people may be believers and they have become so stagnant and burnt and things that, that they are just going through the motions. Maybe they even still show up on Sunday, um, but they're not pressing in. They're not having a, um intimate relationship. They're not regularly talking to God. They're not regularly reading the word and praying. So they're, they're not communicating with God on a frequent basis. All relationships require interaction require communication um, and you get what you put into it so to speak so as I thought about this I was reminded of Jesus's parable of the sower you know that he was trying to teach the disciples about the hearts of different people and he used the imagery of a farmer and in those days um, you know just like today I suppose you know the ground had to be tilled but in most of the land, there were these thorn bushes that were, they weren't 
I don't know if they had, I don't think they had any fruit on them, but they were kind of like blackberries in that they just grow wild and get all tangled up or, or like ivy, which is not a thorn bush, but I, it had that same like, like a disease almost, man. It would just like take over the land. And, and so when they would get a field ready, they had to, to um, tear out all of these thorn bushes. And sometimes they had to just set it on fire. The whole field had to be set on fire to get rid of these things. And then they would dig out the rocks as they were tilling it so that the soil was ready to receive the seed. But, you know, to get to the field, there was a path. And that path, um, people walked on it constantly. And so it was very pressed down and hard. Um, you know, probably when it rained, the water just kind of rolled off of it. And... Um, next to the the um this great soil was also um these thorn bushes that hadn't been torn down and and probably there was a pile of rocks somewhere where they had taken it out and so he's giving this image of this where you've got the farmer and he's got his bag of seeds uh, the ground has been tilled and he's out there doing what they call broadcasting he's like throwing the seed out as he's taking it out of the bag and some of it falls over onto the path, and some of it falls into the thorn bush area, and some of it falls into the rocks, and some of it so falls into the good soil. And he talks about how, you know, the stuff that falls on the path, um, the nothing really happens to it. You know, it probably uh, bounces off of the path. Or it, while it's laying there, somebody comes and steps by and it gets on the bottom of their sandal. Um, or a bird sees it and flies down and grabs it up and eats it. You know, and then you have the, um, the seeds that have fallen into the rocky area. Now, the soil underneath the rocks, um, you know, is a little bit softer than that of the, um, the path. And so the seed's able to take some root. But because of the rocks, it doesn't get enough nourishment. The, enough water doesn't get on it and stuff. And it ends up, after it sprouts, just dying. And then the last one was the thorns. And, and basically, the seed had to compete with all the roots of the thorn. You know, so, you know, and, and so the disciples said, you know, what's, what's this about? I know it's about more than just going out and farming. Um, I think everybody knows those things. And so he said that these are all the hearts of people. The soil are their hearts, their, their um, willingness to trust in God. And so the, the hard heart or the one that's on the path, it says that they hear the word. So, and generally the word here in, in Greek means to um, not just that it goes in one ear and out the other, but you actually think about it. So they're hungry, but they're not ready. They're not ready, the, and, and so they dismiss the word. They, they listen to it maybe because you're their friend or um, they trust you for other things. And so they listen to it and they actually think about it, but their heart's not in a place where they're able to have faith in it. They can't imagine that there could be a God that loves me so much that he'd die for me and um, redeem me and forgive me and so forth. Um, and so, you know, they, they're jaded and they don't trust and they expect to be let down. And unfortunately, because of that, their hope is in themselves and they know that they'll let themselves down. And so they don't have a whole lot of hope. They're, they're you know, pitiful sort of, I mean, certainly from our perspective. Um, and so they're not ready. The next heart, the shallow heart, or the, the heart that um, is troubled, that's the one with the, um, the rocks. They are believers. They have not only heard the word, but they've been born again. But because they're not pursuing God, they, they're stagnant, they're... they're um, they're not being equipped for trials because they're not on a regular basis communicating with God. They're not reading God's word every day. They're not, so they're not hearing, they're not going and saying, hey, dad, what do you have to say for today? 
um, and they're not talking to him on a frequent basis. They're probably, most of the time, they're doing that is when troubles happen in their lives. So th they're not equipped for these trials. The trials overwhelm them. The things that happen in life overwhelm them because they are not connected to God. They, they don't find their hope in God, and they don't have the trust because they haven't. Trust comes with relationship, with time, with seeing that the person is trustworthy. So they're not fully pursuing God. They're not equipped for trials. They trust very little, so they have very little faith, and they're easily disappointed. You know, when they see a trouble and then they run to God and start talking to God and asking for help, and then it doesn't come out the way that they want it, they, they get discouraged and disappointed in God. Like he, ha he, he let them down just like everybody else, like every other human. Um, but the thing is, the way God works, he wants what's best for us. And sometimes that may mean we have to go through something that's not comfortable. It, it seems like discomfort is what transforms our character. And that is more important to God. He wants his children to have high character, to be loving and good and, and selfless. And sometimes we have to go through some hardship for that to be purged out of us. You know, Paul said in Romans that if you're to be transformed, that's the word metamorphosis, then you have to renew your mind. You have to change the way that you think. If you're doing it on an infrequent basis, it's just not going to happen. You're going to not be prepared for these trials that come, and you'll continue to learn the wrong lessons that, you know, that's the way we're going to be transformed, that, that we're regularly talking to God, and it's changing how we see things so that when junk happens, when the stuff hits the fan, it won't throw us off. It won't cause us to be in peril and, and fret and things for it. So then the, the thorny heart or the, the thorn bush heart, these folks are double-minded. They are stagnant. So they have been born again and um, they have sprouted up and they, um, something has happened in their life and the worries of this life, that's the, the roots of the thorn bush, the, these worries of their life have taken them off guard, and they have become stagnant, meaning that, that they suddenly have stopped pursuing God. They, they have diminished from reading his word and praying, and so their relationship has backed off, and they don't want to get hurt, and, and so they, they, they don't connect. They stop connecting to the body of Christ. Um, maybe they stop coming to church, or they come to the church, and they sit in the back and there's nothing wrong with sitting in the back but they sit there their reasoning for sitting in the back is because they don't want to have anybody say anything to them and they like they come in sit there and then leave before anybody can um, say hello to them or anything because they don't want anything to come to light they don't want to be changed they at that point and maybe they don't realize that first and foremost in their mind but they're not wanting to change they they feel comfortable hey where i am at in this stagnant stinky place that's not moving on um i'm not getting hurt i've protected myself and so the they have to be changed and these are the various folks that god's going to be sending in here i think more so probably some of the the thornbush people are going to be coming in. People that formerly maybe they were just fully connected with God and pursuing him and something just really tripped them up. Maybe they sinned or maybe some really cruddy thing happened in their life, you know, like maybe somebody divorced them or, or maybe a, a child passed away in their life. You know, it's something traumatic that has ju just set them back um, and because of that and because of maybe being mad at God and so forth they have stopped talking to him they're giving him the cold shoulder and unfortunately that causes us to be stagnant so the thing is though what the Lord wants us to do by being in unity and loving one another as people come here or we meet them on the street we need to love them 
regardless of even when they snap at you and stuff, we need to be patient and kind with them. That's what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13 when he was defining love. He said that love is patient and it is kind. All those other things, not keeping a record of wrong and so forth, all have to do with being patient and kind. You know, when somebody does you wrong, if you like, okay, check, you know, check, oh, three strikes, you're out of here type of thing, um, that's not being patient with them and it's not being kind with them. And, and it's something that we have to intentionally do. Um, we have to keep that mindset because things come up. I mean, one thing, we have this body and we could be in pain. Um, somebody could cut us off on the highway and it's 115 or blood sugar drops or whatever. And if we don't crucify our flesh, Paul says, with our passions and desires, then um, we're going to not do the right thing. We will not love. You know, we can change our mind the way we think, but then we've got this body that we have to crucify. We have to just subjugate it. We have to say no to it. There's no transforming that. It won't be transformed until we're dead or, the, or Jesus comes back and takes us away. When we get this glorious body, then we won't have to crucify it. It'll be changed. It'll be different. But while we're stuck in it, so to speak, it is our biggest, weakest link that the enemy is going to pull us in with. And so we have to intentionally um, watch it and be alert. And the Holy Spirit will help you with that. He'll alert you when um, maybe you're getting impatient with something or someone. Um, he will alert you and say, hey, you better um, cool out here or you're going to do stuff that will not be like I would do it type of thing. So these folks are going to come, and we need to be able to be patient and kind with them. So another thing that stood out to me really about that same phrase, our citizenship is in heaven. The word in implies we're not home. This place is not home. The world is not our homeland. That means we're aliens. We are residents in a foreign country and a foreign culture. Now, we came from that culture, and that's probably one gauge that you can look at. Um, if you still um, are part of that culture, if you still think the same way, then you know you've got some ways to go. Um, but our citizenship is in heaven, meaning that, that we're not in the country where our citizenship is at. It'd be like um, being a citizen in the United States, but you're over in France um, or, the, or Israel or someplace like that. We are not in our homeland. Now, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 11, when he starts talking about all the heroes of the faith, um, after he had said all these things that they did, he said that, he said that those who lived by faith understood they were aliens and strangers on earth. And it says that they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. So we need to recognize that we're part of something different, that we are set apart. That's really what the, the word holiness, that's what it means to be set apart. We are not our own. And, um, I think it's in Peter um, it says that not only are we citizens of heaven, but we're members of God's household. So we're part of his family. We are part of his family. We are sons and daughters of God. And he, he's a father that does not want any spoiled children. So that means we're going to go through some discipline, you know, spanking of sorts that um, will say, hey, wait a minute, brother. That was not too kind. That was not very patient of you. Um, and we'll reap something. Um, and that will teach us. That will train us that that's not the way to go. So, so faith 
is our culture. The culture of heaven is one of trust. You know, remember Paul said at the end of 1 Corinthians 13, he says, faith, hope, and charity are love, but the greatest of these is love, meaning that it all starts out of love. God loved us first, and that allows us to love him back. When we begin to love him back, then we begin to trust him. We begin to have faith in him. And with faith comes hope, not for possibilities. Biblical hope does not mean, I wish this would happen. It means, I know God's going to do something awesome, um, and it may not feel great on the way there, but it's going to be awesome. And so I eagerly await it. I eagerly await what God has to do. It's like going on the roller coaster and you're going up the hill, chink, 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 and you're, you're like, oh, what's about to happen? Chink, 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 chink. And then at the top, whoo. That's the excitement that we should have for what God's going to do um, through us and in us. All righty. So, um, so the next thing that stood out to me is that we eagerly await a savior or a deliverer. The enemies of the cross, the citizens of earth, the here and now folks, they don't await a savior. Some wish for one, but they only put their hope in themselves and what they can do, what they can see and feel. So that's the thing that the folks that God's going to send, they're going to test you. Remember what I read, um, probably not all you were here, but in Psalms 126, um, the writer of Psalms is relating what it felt like when the, the exiles came back from Babylon and Persia and came back to Israel. It, you know, they found their homeland was in disarray. The buildings were all knocked down. The fields probably had thorn bushes and rocks and stuff all over them. And they had to, to you know, they just cried about it, you know, what once was, you know, and and so they began to go out there and clear it away, and um, through a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, they got a crop going, and then when it finally came in, they had a humongous harvest, and so I felt like the Lord is saying that the folks that God is going to send to us, we're going to be sowing into their lives, and there'll be tears involved in it, um, because sometimes there'll be a lot of pushback, there'll be resistance, um, but we need to continue on. We need to continue to love them. And um, eventually we're going to rejoice. We're going to be excited about what comes in. So, the church, Jesus' body, not this building, contends for one another. If you are the church, if you want to be the church then you have to contend for one another do we have close enough relationships with one another and i know we are a small body right now and we certainly know each other um, but how deeply do we know one another how deeply have we taken a chance to get to know one another and um, risk but the church loves each other jesus said to his disciples to us that they will know us by the love we have for one another. If TV's any indication, the world doesn't know that. The way they portray Christians is not that way. And maybe some of that is the church's fault. So we need to love one another. Now, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 12, that and he was talking about spiritual gifts and how we that spiritual gifts are for us for each other um, for ministering to one another and lifting one another up and and um, that church you know was very dysfunctional um, and was very immature and they saw spiritual gifts as like brownie points or badges or like you know, hey, I'm better than you because I can speak in tongues, or I'm better than you because I have words of prophecy. I'm better than you, you know. That, so obviously you can be immature and the Holy Spirit will still work in you. Um, you know, he, he works with what you have. And so he is saying 
that, you know, we're this body. We're Jesus' body. Jesus is the head, and we're his body. And he says, if one part suffers, everyone suffers. And if one part is honored, then everybody rejoices. Now, I was thinking about that. If one part suffers, we all suffer. Um, Sam um, stubbed his toe. <laughs> Sam Mallard um, stubbed his toe, and his whole body felt the suffering. Um, I mean, every part of him, his hands came to rescue of his toe, you know, um, but his brain knew it happened. Do we, do we know each other well enough that when we're suffering, that we suffer as well, that, that we have anguish? And, and, you know, when James talked about the, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, I believe when we truly know, for, know each other and love each other, then our prayers, our intercession, we want to contend for one another. We want to intercede. We want to stand in the gap for one another, and it will be effective, and it will be fervent because we love each other. We love each other deeply. So we need to be intentional in that. Everyone hungers to be known, affirmed, embraced, honored, remembered by those loved. And I think that's part of us being made in the image of God, that ability um, to do that for others and to want it is part of being made in the image of God. But sometimes, of course, we put other people as gods. And we, you know, really our motivation is probably ourself. We do nice things to somebody because we want them to do nice things to us. We want to be loved by them and so forth. Um, our motivation should be that I want the good for this other, regardless of whether they ever reciprocate it. Um, but because we have that hunger in us, and these folks will have that, um, and maybe they've squashed it down, but in our love for them, we will help them become the redeemed and no longer the captives. The captive, as they come, our love will be a catalyst for the Holy Spirit to break the bonds, to give sight of the blind and to heal the brokenhearted. So the Holy Spirit works through us. When we have relationships with people and basically we become endeared to them, it becomes a catalyst. It, it helps their heart open up and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to them through us. Sometimes, you know, and really most of the time it begins with just our actions, how we conduct our life and that they know that we care about them and we want the best for them. All right, so the next, um, and I think it's verse 21. The Lord Jesus, next our Lord Jesus, his power enables him to bring everything under his control. So this power is effective. It's all that is needed and he's fully able to bring everything into submission. Remember, Jesus was given all authority in heaven and earth. He has also the power to accomplish it. He has called us, the one who has all authority and power to bring everything into submission. He has called us. Our English word authority is derived from the word author. Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. Trust is integral. If we don't trust God, then we don't have hope in him. We must trust him despite the circumstances we see ourselves in. We can't believe that he's let us down. We must fight that. You know, and the thing is, at least my experience, when I'm in the midst of those things, you know, it may be painful and troubling. But later on, because remember, the Lord says through Paul that, that there's always a way out. And he doesn't mean that there's a way to get out of it. What he is saying is that it doesn't go on forever. Trials and testings have a period of time that the Lord has set for us to go through for the transformative work. So we can know that he'll never put anything on us that we can't do. 
Um, and all of the things that he does is to, to kind of hurt us towards him, to, to allow us to trust him. That's what he did with the Israelites when they were sent off to exile and they were upset about what they had lost. Um, Jeremiah, the Holy Spirit through Jeremiah said, said, hey, I'm God and I know the plans I have for you. They're to bless you. You know, and so he's telling this to people that just had their houses burnt down and their crops burnt and they're taken off into chains or whatever to another country. He's saying, I know the plans I have for you. And then he explains, he says, you know, when this time is over, your hearts will be changed and you'll be able to trust me. You'll be able to trust that I have your back and that all the things I do in the end will work out for you. All things work to the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. He has a purpose for everybody. You are all called for a purpose. But there's something on us. We have to love him. When we love him, then we're going to want to know what our call is. And when we begin to get into that thing, and we know that it's what God wants us to do, then it will work out to our good, to our good. So lastly, in verse 1 of chapter 4, the phrase, well, it starts off, therefore, brothers, but that is how you should stand firm. So he's been talking to them um, since verse 12 about pressing into God. You know, in verses 12 through 14, he talked about who speaks into your life. Who do you allow to speak into your life? Do you, is God the one that's speaking into your life? Or are circumstances and other people speaking into your life? Who is it that you listen to? Um, verses 15 and 16, he says that the mature, um, those that are adult, will will look to him to to see the pattern to live that um but he says wherever you're at live up to that and then in verses 17 through 19 he talks about um the example that he has set and that the people around you that are um living that way and he says to look to them so he's saying that we all need to look for a mentor we all need to be discipled by somebody we all should pursue that. So, so he's saying to stand firm. Now, this, is a, this was also used by Paul in Ephesians where he was talking about when you've done everything you can to stand, stand. You know, and he's using the imagery of a soldier in armor. You know, and in battle, if you don't stand your ground, if you get knocked down, then they're going to kill you. They're going to stab you when you're down. You know, when you're down, they can, they can put their foot on your, your chest, on your arms, whatever, and whoosh, with the sword, you know. And so he's saying that you need to stand. When you've done everything you can, just stand. That's perseverance. Um, James talks about that. He says when various trials come, persevere, meaning um, endure. Go through it. Don't give up. Go the extra mile. Go the whole way. Um, and now James is talking about, he's using imagery of, of metal and uh, uh, really of ore. And it's got all these impurities in it and the process of removing those impurities. Don't give up. Perseverance, it says, has a work in us. So when we become more durable, it's able to do more things into us. It's able to equip us and and help us to become mature, and he promises that when you're mature, you will lack nothing. So, Father, I just thank you for your love and kindness and your mercies, Lord. I thank you that you have, you didn't leave us without your word. Lord, I thank you that you have given us your word and that, that we can hear what you have to say, that there is nothing that you don't have something to say about it, God that we can find out which way we should go, that we just need to pursue you, Lord. Help our hearts to pursue you. Um, enable us to pursue you and to be steadfast in that, to, to not be complacent and not to just stand still and think we've arrived. 
Lord, that, that somehow or another we become fully mature. Maturity requires constant work and use. We just thank you, Jesus, for your loving kindness and mercy. We thank you for your provision, Lord. We ask that you would just bless our week, Lord, that, that, that each morning, each day, as we engage you, Lord, that you would show yourself to us, that you would be present there right in our house or our car or wherever it is, that, that you would make yourself known, that we would know that you're present as we are hearing what you have to say and we're talking to you, Lord, that we would sense it, that we'd be empowered by your spirit. Lord, just fill us, fill us with your spirit, Lord. Renew it, refresh us, refill us. Lord, just refill us. And we just thank you in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.